So we're still talking about problems with the expected utility theory. And we're almost at the end. We talked about anchoring problem number six. It's a little harder to describe these other problems. I'm going to use some illustrations in just a second. Let me just say that behavioral economists, and there's also a field called behavioral finance, are really interested in situations where expected utility doesn't work in the sense that people don't behave the way that the expected utility hypothesis, which is this hypothesis here, would predict that they behave. They behave in ways that that, that theory can't explain. In, in behavioral economics, you see descriptions like mental accounting, that uh, instead of people, let's say, looking at their or behavioral finance, people looking at their investment portfolio as a whole, they instead look at it in different parts. Like, you know, this is the part for college saving, and that's the part for retirement saving, and this is the part for my vacation saving. Instead of, so, so they, they, they put it in little boxes instead of looking at it holistically. Uh, prospect theory is an alternative to expected utility, which we're not going to get into, but but people are certainly trying to come up with alternatives to expected utility theory because it does have these problems and there these these cases where where it doesn't work. So I'm going to illustrate these kinds of difficulties using two famous paradoxes. One is called the Allais paradox and the other is called the Ells or Ellsberg paradox. So let me move to my illustration of the LA paradox. Okay. Now, as the web page says, this is an excerpt from the book I used to teach Econ 7005. It's the uh, introductory microeconomic theory class for PhD students. And so I'm not going to go into the details here, but this just is a pretty good example of the LA paradox. And then the Ellsberg paradox comes from the same book. So I just want to, to do this in a rather superficial way. Think about being asked to choose between two gambles or two lotteries. Gamble A, you get a million dollars for sure. And gamble B, you get 10% chance of $5 million, 89% chance of $1 million, but there's a 1% chance you don't get anything at all. And and uh, the author here, Hal Varian, asks, before you read any further, pick one of these gambles and write it down. So I'm going to pause for five seconds to let you do that. Which would you which would you pick, A or B? Here's the five second pause. Okay. Now consider the following two gambles. Gamble C, an 11% chance of 1 million and an 89% chance of nothing. And gamble D, a 10% chance of five, 5 million and a 90% chance of nothing. Again, please pick one of these two gambles as your preferred choice and write it down. So I'll pause again for another five seconds. Okay. Many people prefer A to B and D to C. And you might have. Now, when I run this in a class with students, I get usually a little bit more than half the class has this pattern. They prefer A to B and D to C. However, these choices violate the expected utility axioms. So the expected utility axioms are the mathematical properties that give rise to the expected utility formula. Now, I'm not going to, to, to go through the math here because that's what I do with PhD students. But, but this is called the LA paradox because this doesn't seem to be irrational behavior. Indeed, it's not irrational behavior. 
but it doesn't match expected utility. This is the failure of the expected utility hypothesis. And it means that while expected utility is a big improvement over expected value, it's not perfect in capturing the way lots of people respond to uncertainty. Okay, next, uh, next one here is the Ellsberg paradox. Okay, the Ellsberg paradox. So this concerns subjective probability theory. You are told told that an urn contains, three, contains 300 balls. 100 of them are red. And 200 of them are either blue or green. You don't know which. Gamble A, you receive $1,000 if the ball is red. Gamble B, you receive $1,000 if the ball is blue. Write down which of these two gambles you prefer. So again, the urn has 300 balls, 100 are red, and 200 are either blue or green. So I'll pause for five seconds, let you write down which one you would pick. All right. Next, consider the following two gambles. You receive $1,000 if the ball isn't red. D, you receive $1,000 if the ball isn't blue. I'll give you five seconds. Write down which gamble you choose between these two. C, you get $1,000 if the ball is not red. D, you get $1,000 if the ball is not blue. All right. It's common for people to pick A over B and C over D. But it turns out that these preferences violate standard subjective probability theory, which is based, and, sub, and, and this so-called standard subjective probability theory is based on the expected utility axioms. Now, again, I'm not going to go through the, the math, and you don't have to worry about the math. I would never ask you the math on an exam. But it's not weird. It's not irrational for people to prefer A to B and to prefer C to D. Lots of people do that, but it turns out that doesn't match the ex expected utility axioms. Now, it's interesting the way that this author talks about the LA paradox and the Ellsberg paradox. He says, opinions differ about the importance of the LA paradox and the Ellsberg paradox. Some economists think these anomalies require new models to describe people's behavior. Others think that these paradoxes are akin to optical illusions. Even though people are poor at judging distances under some circumstances, doesn't mean we need to invent a new concept of distance. Um, now, I happen to disagree with the author. I think that the purpose of economics is, is to describe the way that people actually work, that people actually behave. And the LA paradox and the Ellsworth paradox show that people don't always behave in ways that are consistent with expected utility. And so I think we do need to come up with a new model of behavior under uncertainty that explains what people really do. Your author doesn't agree with me. And so I, w I wanted to read you uh, what he wrote and, and, uh, and how he's trying to justify. It. Again, his name, I said his name before, the, uh, the author of this passage the author of this textbook is, is Hal Varian. The citation is on the is on the web page. Let me just make a comment about Hal Varian. Hal Varian was a professor of economics at the University of Michigan. Then he became dean of I don't remember exactly what it's called, something like the School of Information Science at University of California, Berkeley. And then he became the chief economist at Google or Google's parent company Alphabet. And as far as I know, he is uh, he, he's still the, uh, the chief economist there. So he's a, an extremely prominent economist. And I, I do use his textbooks when I teach Econ 7, 11, and 5, but I, I, don't actually, I don't actually agree with him here. Oh, and one uh, little thing I wanted to mention. Um, 
you know, we, start, we talked about the Allais paradox and the Ellsberg paradox. Allais was a French economist. Ellsberg, Ellsberg is kind of interesting. Let me see if I can, um, I'm going to pause my screen for a minute. So the Ellsberg paradox is named after Daniel Ellsberg, who is an economist, but not an academic economist. He was a United States military analyst during the 1960s, worked on a top secret Pentagon study of US government decision making in relation to the Vietnam War, which was called the Pentagon Papers. This was a, a secret study, which Ellsberg then released to the New York Times and the Washington Post and other newspapers. He was, as Wikipedia says here, charged under the Espionage Act of 1917, but the charges were dismissed. So he's a lot more famous for his activism along these lines than for inventing the, uh, the Ellsberg Paradox, but here you can see the Ellsberg Paradox is, uh, is mentioned here. Uh, here, let me, as, um, as as one as as his contribution to economics and decision theory. Okay, so let me go back. All right, so we're back and we talked about the Ellsberg paradox and we talked about I mean the LA paradox and we talked about the Ellsberg paradox. So final objection. One's WTP or WTA may depend on the actions or the fate of other people. The book talks about sharing costs and risks. So Suppose there there are plans to build uh, an oil refinery next to your house, and most of the time oil refineries don't explode, but on occasion they do. So that's a probabilistic event whether or not it's going to explode. People may have a different WATP or WTA, a different different valuation on how bad it is to live next to an oil refinery. If they're the only person that lives, that's going to be living next to this oil refinery, or if there are a whole bunch of other people that are going to be living next to the oil refinery. I mean, imagine that um, on the one hand, um, the only people that are going to be living around this oil refinery are you and people just like you in your same social class, in your same neighborhood. Whereas on the other hand, there, the oil refinery is going to be next to two, two neighborhoods, one is your neighborhood, and one is another neighborhood where the mayor of your city and your congressman have houses. So they're going to be living just as close, the mayor of your city and your congressman are going to be living just as close to this oil refinery as you are. In the second situation, it feels like you're sharing the risks with other people, including you know, important wealthy decision makers. And so you may feel better about living next to the oil refinery in the second situation than in the first situation. So that's that's attacking here this this utility function idea that just like with anchoring your utility function change with time the final objection is that your your utility function ch changes depending on how shared the costs and risks are with other people. Now it's not sharing, uh, let me be clear about what I mean by sharing here. It's not diminishing your risk. I mean, if the oil refinery explodes, your home is going to suffer exactly the same damage regardless of whether the mayor's house gets damaged or the mayor's house doesn't get damaged. So the payoff is the same in these two situations. But the way you feel about that payoff, the way you feel about your roof getting half destroyed, so your roof is going to get half destroyed either way. But the way you feel about it is different depending on whether the mayor's roof gets destroyed or whether there's no chance the mayor's roof is going to get destroyed because he lives 20 miles away. So it's the utility function that varies given exactly the same bad outcome because of whether you feel other people are sharing in the risk or not. All right, so having said all this about expected utility, I still have to say that expected utility is what economists usually use. 
Now, yes, there are economists that use prospect theory. And there are economists that use other kinds of non-expected utility. Uh, there's um, an ev even a Nobel Prize which, uh, won by uh, a Kahneman. So Kahneman and Tversky are with two psychologists who started working on studying how people in the real world actually uh, actually think about probabilistic situations. And T Tversky passed away quite a while ago, but Kahneman actually won the Nobel Prize in economics for this work. S and certainly behavioral economists and people working in behavioral finance take all this stuff very seriously, and they don't use expected ut utility as their way of thinking about how humans react in probabilistic situations. But but most economists do, and because expected utility is a very simple way of of modeling the way that the humans react to probabilistic situations. Okay, so that is all for chapter nine. We'll go to chapter ten next time.